So I think uh, that I'm invited is uh, due to the fact that I'm talking about a very general topic uh, which everybody needs in, in science and actually also practically. This is uh, about units, about the international system of units. Uh, and this will be uh, significantly revised uh, in, uh, and coming in force on 20th of May of this year uh, for the benefit uh, not only of science and research but also for industry, global trade and for society because uh, the international system of units is a practical system, not only for science but for science as well, for sure. Okay, so um, more than 4,500 years ago people knew that certain properties of artifacts, substances or phenomena can be measured. So the height of this pyramid is a certain quantity and can be expressed in a value and a unit, 100 meters say, and the unit typically was an artifact and they are beautiful examples in the past from artifacts, ancient Egyptian royal cubit, Babylonian weights or recently I had the pleasure to see ancient Chinese volume units here in, uh, in Taiwan actually. Now, uh, artifacts have, a, have a, an advantage because you have your qubit always with you, you have your standard with you. Uh, disadvantage, obviously, is that there are infinitely many. Okay, so you take the royal qubit, and this was actually very serious. The working standards had to be calibrated every six week, weeks by penalty of death. So this is obviously a very serious business. Now, depending on the unit, you get different values. So for the, for, for the same uh, quantity you measure, uh, there might be confusion. And since in Germany, we had not a strong king since a long time, we had many, very many different qubits. So in Braunschweig, it was 57.7 uh, centimeters. You can actually also find someone in the Regensburg at a very prominent place at the cathedral. You look at that, so here are the, the units here. And if you project it out, and you can see here, der Stadt Schuh, der Stadt Ölln, der Stadt Klafter. So very, very importantly. Uh, at the end of the 19th century in Germany, we had more than 40 different uh, qubits from Braunschweig, a smaller one, as you can see, Regensburg, relatively large. Actually, the largest one was the Bavarian qubit, whatever you conclude out of that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 concerning the feet, the foot, the largest foot was the Prussian one, the Berlin one, and you may also draw conclusions out of that. Okay, so nevertheless, it's clear this is a technical obstacle for trade and manufacture. And uh, now you can say, okay, uh, in, maybe in France it was better. They had one strong king at those times. It was not better. They had 250,000 different units. Uh, for the lengths, for instance, the Ligne, the Pouze, the Pierre, Tours, Breche, Le de Post, and so on and so forth. So uh, really a uh, confusing situation. And then came up an idea by Condorcet, a mathematician and philosopher, in 1775. Uh, he said uh, that uh, one should assure that measurements are invariable by making use of a standard borrowed from a natural phenomenon, a universal standard that will allow the adhesion of all uni nations, not only of one kingdom and so on. So, uh, but uh, he was not successful at those times. He had to wait until the French Revolution came. And the French revolutioners were really visionary also in this uh, direction. And they wanted to create units, à tout le temps, à tout le peuple, for all times and for all civilizations. Uh, and uh, they created actually a high rank uh, a committee uh, consisting of Lagrange, Laplace, Borda, Morge, Corrosé from the French Academy of Science. And they came up with a suggestion uh, that was based on the decimal system, actually even clocks, the time was, the day was uh, divided into 10 hours only, also based on the decimal system and on the properties of the Earth because this belongs to everybody living on Earth. And uh, the idea was to take the 10,000th part of a quarter of the Earth meridian to define the meter. Uh, two people were charged, Machin and Delambre, to measure by triangulation uh, the, 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 the distance from Dunkirk to Barcelona and from that conclude how long the meter should be. And this then actually was uh, the definition of the meter. Just to make it completely general, it had to go, the meridian had to go to, uh, through Paris. Oh, 
uh, but uh, this is a minor, uh, mi minor uh, obstacle. Yeah, uh, French people were not happy about these definitions, and you know what happens if French people are not happy. Uh, they just uh, do what they want, I would say. Uh, and it took another 100 years uh, until the Media Convention was signed in 1875 by 70 states as, uh, at that time. This was uh, one of the first international organizations, beautifully located up to the present day in Sèvres, in Paris. You can look at it and you can visit it. And uh, they actually then took the meter out of the arch archives, of the French archives, and defined it as the length of the, uh, as a unit of length. And accordingly, uh, the weight of 10 cubic centimeters of water at zero degrees Celsius as one kilogram, and this is the artifact actually, which was also coming from the French Revolution in 1799. And the second under those, uh, in, in these times, was under the auspices of astronomers. But what you can see here, the units are based on the property of our Earth. Even though, in 1870, it was clear that this is maybe not a good definition. Uh, this was James Clerk Maxwell uh, saying that these definitions of the units are no true invariance, since the properties of a planet can change. It would still be the same planet. But if the properties of an atom were to be changed, it would not longer be the same atom. So one should take the properties of atom. For that, however, you have to understand atoms. You have to understand quantum mechanics. And very interestingly, at the very same time, uh, in, in Berlin, uh, the Physikalische Technische Reichsanstalt, our predecessor uh, organization, was founded in 1887. By, uh, by, Werner von, by Hermann von Helmholtz, by Werner von Siemens and uh, Wilhelm Förster, uh, a very uh, yeah, strong science organization at those times, 14 Nobel Prize winners in our scientific advisory boards. Today we still have three, three von Klitzing, Hensch and Kederle. And this was actually the birthplace of quantum mechanics, as <coughs> probably everybody learns in the, in, in the first semesters of a physics uh, um <coughs> Uh, cause. Now, um, what people did here, they uh, looked for black body radiation. This is the radiation coming out of a little hole here in a black body <coughs> at a certain temperature. And this uh, actually is the apparatus, <coughs> the ancient apparatus here, and these are the measurements. So what you see at low temperature, you are at long wavelengths and, uh, and, uh, and uh, low intensities. If you crank up the temperature, you go up with the intensity tremendously and go to lower, uh, to lower wavelengths. Now, uh, Lummer and his team from the Reichsanstalt discovered that there was a little difference uh, by doing very, very precise measurements at, high, at, at uh, large wavelengths. And he called Max Planck. Max Planck was in the curatorium. And Max Planck, as he said, in an act of despair, had to quantize uh, the properties of the oscillators in the wall, the, uh, the, 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 the action, last but not least. And he quantized by that, by the end of the day, the radiation field. And what started, I would say, as basic research, as a kind of esoteric metrology, nobody cared about these little deviations here, uh, not in industry and so on, is, uh, became the foundation of quantum mechanics, which nowadays underpins about 60% of the world economy. So, yes, this is a little bit history, and now the question is, where are we? So I would first like to talk a little bit about the Meter Convention, which is a cornerstone of uh, global quality infrastructure. Uh, I give you some motivation for the revision of the SI, uh, how we link it to the defining constants, and uh, then we might ask the question, uh, if we have these constants, are these constants really constant in time and space? Cornerstone of global SI, of, of uh, QI. So in uh, 1960, the General Conference on the Media Convention established the system uh, of units as we have it presently, essentially at least, uh, with the base quantities, length, mass, time, electric current, temperature, amount of substance, and luminous intensity. Uh, this is, these are our base quantities with base units, with the symbols and so on. All of that you can find in the SI brochure. We have derived units like meter per second for the velocity and so on. Uh, we have derived units with special names like the hertz for one over second or the force, the newton. Uh, we can do a, a dimensional calculation, uh, which is very important often uh, for seeing whether your equations are correct. 
Uh, and this all together forms a set of coherent SI units, as we say it. We need no factors in between, no conversion factors in between. And this is a global measurement infrastructure, actually, where you can measure everything which is of any importance in science or in practical applications, like the intensity of a light from, a, for, from an LED, CO2, CO2 concentration in the air, creatinine concentration in your blood serum, and so on and so forth. This system is now valid worldwide. The mutual recognition arrangement has been signed by 101 member and associated states, four international organizations, and so on. Uh, and uh, they represent 98% of the world economic power. So whenever you wanted to trade, you have to uh, obey this kind of system. So this is a basis for worldwide trade, and this is a basis also for worldwide what we call quality infrastructure. Uh, and this is indicated uh, by this number here. Worldwide, we have about 65,000 uh, calibration laboratories, and they, in order to be accredited uh, by this norm here, they have to make sure that all their measurements are traceable to the SI. Otherwise, nobody would believe, otherwise nobody would buy at the end of the day. Okay, so if you have such a beautiful system, why should we change? Uh, and this is the uh, second part of my talk. <coughs> And uh, here I would like to just introduce where we stand and what the reasons are for change. Now, the second was redefined, actually, uh, from astronomers uh, in 1967, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, uh, by fixing the numerical value of a constant of nature, I would say, namely the hyperfine transition frequency in the cesium-133 atom. And this Finally, is a, is, a, is a suggestion by, Max, by, by, by Maxwell, saying you should take the properties of an atom. So, uh, exactly 9 billion, 192 million, 631,770, I would say, oscillations in this little pendulum is exactly defined to be one second. When we define it like that, we could measure it on, uh, on the level of 10 to minus 14 uncertainty. Today, with atomic fountain clocks, we can do that 100 times better. And here you see one of the advantages of such a definition. You can improve your realization uncertainty uh, without changing the definition uh, in, in this kind of, uh, of, uh, of characterization. And the same is true for the meter. In, 18, uh, in 1983, we defined it by fixing the numerical value of a fundamental constant of nature, I would say, namely the speed of light. Uh, to be exactly 299,792,458 meter per second. And this is following a suggestion of Max Planck. I will come to that a little later in my talk. Uh, and with that definition, again, we can, measure <coughs> we can measure all lengths from the very small ones, micrometer down to nanometer, even down to picometer nowadays, up to astrono astronomical distances, the distance from here to the moon, with an uncertainty of about three centimeters. And again, these things are only, our accuracy is only limited by our technical abilities, not by the definition itself. And this is very different for the Mars, because the Mars is still this little artifact sitting in Paris very quietly in a, in a, in a cabinet, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, defines uh, the unit of, uh, of mass. Um, and since it's very important and very, um, yeah, this has a lot of value, it was only taken out of his cabinet uh, three times in its life since 1889. And it was compared to the national official copies and to their own official copies in Paris. And what you can see here, first of all, the IPK, the international prototype, is always one kilogram per definition. There is nothing, uh, no, no chance to change it. Uh, but the others have changed relative to it. Uh, not much, actually, only 50 microgram, about uh, over, 50, uh, over more than 100 years. So this is fine, but nevertheless, it's very unsatisfactory because uh, nobody knows whether the mass of the IPK is changing over the years. It, it certainly does, but we have no control about it. Uh, this, uh, the material cannot be really characterized, and so on and so forth. And we can never be better than this artifact. Our balances are much better. Uh, but, but basically, we cannot be better than the, uh, the properties of the artifact. And since it's so nice, you might have seen this little movie here. Uh, once in a year, the International Committee of Weights and Measures goes into this cabinet 
and the actually looks kilograms. whether it, it very much looks like that. Uh, this is uh, very realistic, and they all have to make sure that the kilogram is still in its place because the kilogram defines all mass measurements worldwide. And uh, if you let fall it down or if you scratch it, the result would be uh, that the universe is getting heavier uh, because the kilogram still is a kilogram. Okay, it's even worse because the mass enters into the de definition of the candela, luminous intensity, there's a watt, and with that there's a kilogram, obviously in the mole, which is the number of entities in 12 grams of carbon-12. It goes in the old definition of the ampere, which was uh, the, uh, the force in between two infinitely long conductors, infinitely thin, uh, and uh, this was actually a very uh, yeah, not so practical definition, as you can see. Um, and we could only realize, for instance, the ohm on the level of 10 minus 7. So as you also probably all know in this community very well, there have been two uh, yeah, inventions uh, which uh, strongly changed the business in the electrical units, namely the von Glitzing, the, the, the quantum Hall effect and the Josephson effects. And in 1990, uh, the International uh, Committee uh, decided to define, uh, to fix the values of ratios of the Planck constant and electron charge, and by that fixing the von Glitzing and the, uh, and the uh, Josephson constant. And with that definition, we could immediately realize the ohm, for instance, on a level of 10 minus 9, two orders of magnitude better, much, much better than what we had before. This was triggering a revolution in the electrical metrology, for sure. On the other hand, uh, the system is now isolated. It uh, lives, uh, also the ohm and the electrical quantities live in their own quantum world, so to say. And the same is also true for the Kelvin, uh, where we just have two fixed points, the triple point of water and the zero point, uh, also very much uh, independent of all the other definitions. So, you could say we have a non-ideal situation uh, for five out of the seven base quantities. Uh, and the question is, uh, at the same time, we have seen that we have tremendous ben benefits of these kind of quantum-based uh, units. And the question is, can we build a coherent and a consistent quantum-based system of units? And this is exactly uh, what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, this actually, again, is not a new idea. It came up uh, with Max Planck in 1900 when he uh, explained uh, the radiation law. Uh, at the end of his paper in 1900, this is in German, as you can see here, and I translate it uh, into English, at the end he was thinking about units. And he said, <coughs> with the help of fundamental constants, we have the possibility of establishing units of length, time, mass, and temperature, which necessarily retain the validity for all times and civilization, even extraterrestrial and non-human. So extremely visionary, more than 100 years ago. Uh, and you all know these are the Planck units. And the Planck units are not so practical, as you can see here for the time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds, so we cannot really use it. Uh, but the most uh, important problem with the Planck units for practical use is that we don't know the gravitational uh, uh, constant so well, only on the level of 10 to the minus 4, so we cannot use it. It's not accurate enough. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, what we did is we fix the numerical values what we had done before already for the hyperfine transition in, uh, in cesium-133, uh, the speed of light, the Planck constant is new, the electron charge is new, the Boltzmann constant is new, uh, the Avogadro constant for the mole is new, and the uh, luminous efficacy, which we had uh, fixed already before for the uh, optical quantities. And using these uh, fundamental constants uh, and using the equations of physics, we can then realize uh, the units as I'm going to show to you. Now, uh, this is a completely new system. It is a consistent and a coherent set. It is very much based on our present understanding of nature, of physics. Um, it, uh, it has a big advantage. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it cannot change. It guarantees long time stability. So the numbers cannot fall down. They cannot be scratched and whatever. So they are just fixed and they remain fixed uh, for the rest, maybe at least of my life, probably also of the younger people here. Um, and uh, it is mostly a set, depending on the equations you, you, you use, it's most, mostly a set of fundamental constants you need to define a, const, uh, a, a unit here. For, for instance, for the Kelvin, you need the 3 for the Candela, you need uh, the hyperfine transition Planck constant and the luminous efficacy. And for the kilogram, and this is uh, what I would like to elaborate a little bit more, you need uh, the Planck constant in addition to those two. 
Now, usually you have different realizations. You can use different equations. I'm going to show that to you here in this case. And uh, for the macroscopic realization of a kilogram on the basis of these fundamental constants, uh, we have two different possibilities, the silicon crystal method and the Watt balance method. And I would like to explain them to some extent. So in the Watt balance method, you really have a balance. You have really a balance. On the right hand side, you have a weight. Uh, on the other side, you balance this with an electrical force uh, in a magnet, as you can see here. So this would be sufficient, actually, but this quantity here, the, um, the, uh, the ge geometry of your coils is very hard to assess. So you have a second mode where you move the whole thi thing and you induce a current in these coils, and by that, uh, B time, L, L times B drops off the equation. And the final equation which you have is, the mass is uh, combined with the, with the Planck constant. So with this experiment, in the old system, you can measure the Planck constant. And in the new system, when the Planck constant is fixed, you can realize the kilogram. You have to measure the gravitational acceleration at your place and the velocity where you move that thing up and down. Uh, and then you have the direct connection to the Planck constant. And these are actually only numbers. Uh, this is uh, the von Klitzing and uh, Josephson uh, uh, effect, which you need to characterize the current uh, in, in these coils here. OK, so the other possibility is completely different, as you will see. This is a so-called so silicon uh, crystal or Avogadro root. Uh, this is followed by an international collaboration uh, with PDB. And uh, this is actually a crystal sphere of enriched uh, silicon 28. And you can find one outside. If you go outside the, uh, the lecture room here, you can see one of those spheres. Uh, and you count the number of atoms in this sphere. Uh, the basic equation looks like that. Again, you see that the mass is connected to the Planck constant. Uh, it looks difficult, but it's very simple, actually. Uh, the first uh, part here is just the number of atoms. This is the volume of the sphere. This is the lattice constant. And in one unit cell, you have eight atoms. So this is simply, you need to measure the lattice constant and the volume. And this gives you the number of atoms. Now we have the number of atoms. Now you need a mass scale. And the mass scale you get from basic quantum mechanics. This is here. This is the electron mass in the quantum theory of the hydrogen atom. Uh, here's a Planck constant. You need the Rydberg uh, constant, which we know on the level of 10 to minus 12. You need alpha, the fine structure constant, which we know on the level of 10 to minus 10. And C is fixed and H is fixed. Now you have the number of atoms, the mass of the electron, and now we have to relate the mass of the electron to the mass of a typical atom in your in your sphere, and this is done by this uh, equation by uh, isotope uh, measurement and relative measurement, which you can do with a high precision. This is a primary route to the realization of the kilogram. And uh, just to show you one of the most uh, tremendous challenges is to measure the volume of that thing. Uh, we have a spherical volume interferometer. We measure hundred thousands of diameters and fit thousands of polynomials. And from this fit, then finally you get a surface topography. Uh, and the <coughs> here you see actually that the crystal structure, by polishing, you rediscover, so to say, the, the crystal structure uh, of the silicon. And uh, the deviation in the sphere radius from peak to valley here is 35 nanometers. We can even do better and come to something like 10 or 16 nanometers. And if you transfer that to the uh, properties of our Earth, actually, uh, that would mean that uh, the highest mountain, the deepest valley in the ocean, would, would only be two meters apart from each other, so it's extremely round. And we measure that with a precision of a few millimeter uh, in, in, in terms of the Earth's uh, diameter. So this is the roundest object which we have on macroscopic ob object on the world, and probably also in the universe, including neutron, neutron stars. OK, so uh, this is high tech, actually. You need the most advanced uh, length interferometers, the most advanced surface technologies. We have to control the surface, for sure, by XPS and, and, and uh, XRF. Uh, this is the most precise me measurement in chemistry, isotope distributions on the level of 10 to minus 9, which otherwise is very hard to achieve. OK. So now you have two methods for the, for, the, for the kilogram at different national metrology institutes. And so the thing becomes much safer because you can now do key comparisons between all of these measurements and, uh, and see how uh, accurate things are. 
you can operate at least this one here, the Kibble balance, not only for a kilogram, but also for a milligram and possibly for a microgram. So you can realize uh, the unit not only at one point, but at different points. And you can even realize atomic masses by using completely different equations, like the de Broglie or the photon recoil equations. Just to explain that, as an atomic physicist, uh, you come in with a photon, absorb it by an atom. So the momentum of the photon is given to the atom. So the, this is a photon momentum, and the, uh, the, the, the atom starts to move. Rearrangement gives you the mass of the atom. The Planck constant will be fixed. You need to know uh, the, uh, the, the wavelengths of the, of the light, which you can measure very precisely. And you need to measure the velocity of the atom, which you can also do very precisely by cold atom interferometry on the level of 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9. So in the future, basically, we wouldn't need atomic units anymore, uh, also mass units anymore. Uh, we can just uh, realize it in terms of the kilogram. Realization can be everywhere in the world possibly in the universe, so, so you build up your apparatus wherever you want. You only have to make sure that this is correct. So you need to have key comparisons still. This is very important. Um, <clears throat> it is uh, throughout the entire scale sometimes, as you can easily see from the Kelvin. The Kelvin, we had only two fixed points so far, but now we have very many different methods based on this equation, relating uh, the energy of an ensemble to the temperature here for one degree of freedom, as everybody knows, but this is a basic equation. And now you can take uh, Planck's radiation law for the high temperatures, which was actually uh, done even so far. You can use Doppler thermometry, the widening of lines, of Doppler lines, uh, Doppler widening of lines. You can take noise thermometry, the noise in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a resistor, for instance, can be measured, and during directly via this equation then um, yeah, related to the unit. And many other uh, things, so you can, uh, you can realize the unit now over the entire scale with these new uh, definitions. Electrical units are back in the SI. You don't need anymore these artificial constants here because uh, we have fixed the numerical value of the Planck and the electron charge. What you can also see very well with the electrical units is that base units are obviously only a convention. Uh, you can directly realize now the ohm and the volt, so they are basic, if you wish, uh, as you can the ampere by counting electrons per time, or you could even, even more basic would be the coulomb, but just counting electrons. So uh, base units are a convention which we still, however, for several reasons which we need. There's a lot of innovation in industry and research uh, based on these, we, 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 we open the system to innovation. So everybody in, your la in, in, in its lab can take any equation which is suited and develop a technology uh, which realizes units. So uh, for instance, uh, we are just working together with our chairman uh, the, uh, this morning uh, on Johnson noise thermometry, taking the noise and relating it to electrical uh, uh, base units. Uh, we, you can com build a commercial watt balance, uh, which we are uh, going to do at PDB uh, together with the university, uh, that you ha can have in your calibration laboratory and you would be just traceable to the SI. Uh, for this community, maybe more interesting also for the electrical uh, quantities, single electron tunneling devices. So at PDB, uh, we have individual quantum dots here where we shift this potential and get individual electrons through. We can measure these electrons on these islands via the capacity. You can see here a jump when an electron goes on this island. And uh, if you have three of those things, one after the other, this becomes self-referenced. That means uh, you can get rid of counting errors and so on. And we can realize in the new system the ampere at low velocities on the level of 10 to minus 7, which would be the best uh, in the world so far. Now, uh, there are a lot of future applications, as you can see, shot noise-free electronics, because you control the electrons. So the, if you make it massively parallel, and we are working on that, uh, you have a shot noise-free uh, 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 electron source or, or, or current source, quantum electronics, photon technologies can be implemented, and so on. So, uh, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, uh, ongoing projects. Uh, we also test the so-called quantum meteorological triangle. And this is that you have a single electron pump, you charge a condensator, and you measure, uh, the, uh, you measure the resistance and, uh, and, the, 
uh, and the voltage by uh, Josephson and von Klitzing, and by that you realize Ohm's law on a quantum level. And uh, this equation then leads to this equation here. Uh, this is Ohm's law on the quantum level on single electrons. Uh, and then you can see whether all of these uh, uh, yeah, von Klitzing constant and so on, whether they're really uh, what, what we think they are. OK, so uh, other uh, possibilities uh, in the future is that we look for the quantum Hall effect in graphene, for instance. Uh, so at PDB, we have uh, devised uh, the production of ep epitaxial graphene on SIG. Uh, the goal is to uh, realize the quantum Hall effect on in, s in smaller magnetic field because this would be very important for application, makes the thing much more practicable and cheaper. Uh, we have a patented growth method for single graphene layer. Uh, this is here, this is a double uh, graphene layer at this point. And we have demonstrated excellent DC and, uh, and AC quantum Hall down to something like one, uh, one Tesla. So this is a big step, step forward, uh, but has still to be optimized. The next thing is uh, even even uh, yeah larger uh, innovation would be if you have if you could have the quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field using topological insulators and here we had a beautiful uh, collaboration with Professor Molenkamp in Würzburg uh, we could operate the whole thing at zero field see the quantum Hall effect at uh, at low very low currents so far we don't know exactly why that is. Uh, and we could prove uh, with a on a level of 2 times uh, 10 to minus 7 or so uh, that, uh, that we can have the quantum Hall effect in zero magnetic field. Uh, if we can, yeah, we have to improve that. Increased operation currents, signal to noise have to be improved and so on. But if we improve that, then we could dream on a combined electrical standard device uh, out of a quantum Hall resistor, which usually uh, lives at cold temperature and high magnetic fields, and combined with a Josephson uh, voltage standard, which also lives at cold temperatures, but at zero magnetic field. So if you can operate that at zero magnetic field, you combine, can combine them and have all the, your electrical units on one chip. And this is uh, what we are going uh, to work on in the near future. Now. Uh, this would be an inexpensive thing for calibration laboratories. So there's a lot of innovation triggered by this new system. Uh, whenever you do a better experiment, you get a, a better realization, like for the current. I've explained that already. And uh, there are tremendous benefits for the, of this new system, as you can see. Um, it's a huge change, but there should not be a change if you go to the supermarket tomorrow and your kilogram should uh, still be the same kilogram. In order to ensure that, you have to ensure continuity, harmonization, and stability. And by doing, uh, and, and this is achieved by measuring the in the old system the uh, the fundamental constants that we need on a level that is then enough for the realization in the new system. So we had a closing date from CoData, 2000, June 2017, for all of the experiments contributing. And we came up with a relative uncertainty for the electron charge in the order of a few times 10 to minus 9. For the, uh, Kel for the Boltzmann constant, a uh, few times 10 to minus 7, which is good enough for the temperature community. And for the Avogadro and the, uh, Boltzmann, uh, and the Planck constant on the level of 1 times 10 to minus 8. And this was agreed that is sufficient for our present uh, accuracy, <coughs> which we need in trade and uh, also in science. So this is fine. And uh, so we could go ahead and define the new system, uh, namely by fixing the numerical values of all of these constants. And uh, again, you can do that in your pocket. So this is a business card. You can have the international system of units with you, as you could uh, have had your qubit before. And uh, this system is gar guaranteeing long time stability, realization everywhere with ever increasing accuracy as technology proceeds. <coughs> thus triggering uh, innovation in science, industry, and technology. Now, uh, this was decided uh, by uh, the 101 member and associated states in Paris last year to Nobel Prize winner, a historic event, I would say. Uh, and finally, everybody agreed, 
even in some states which are not often so uh, yeah, agreeable to each other. Uh, this was uh, really an emotional moment, I would say, uh, in time to see that this uh, can, that international contracts can still work in a time where it seems to be sometimes difficult uh, and it will come into force at World Meteorology Day in 2019. Okay, so have, do we have a system for all times and cultures throughout the universe? Now, yeah, this depends uh, on whether the constants are really constant. And I would like to show you two slides on, the, on what we know about that presently. Uh, so are the constants constant over the old, uh, from the Big Bang uh, to the present day over the first quarks, the uh, origin of protons at a microsecond, origin of atoms and uh, atomic nuclei 3.5 uh, minutes after the Big Bang up to today. So what you investigate actually is whether the fundamental coupling constant, the neutral uh, uh, dimensionless uh, constant, uh, namely the Sommerfeld fine structure constant, is constant in time. And you can see here, there's electron charge, the Planck constant, and the speed of light. So these are the three really important physical quantities which where the numerical values have been fixed in the new system. Uh, and the, what you measure then is transitions, different transitions in, uh, in, in clocks finally, and they are sensitive on a combination of a potential change in alpha and a potential change of the mass of the electron to the mass of the proton. So you get such a two-dimensional uh, slide here, uh, and different clocks now set different boundary conditions, and finally you are left over with this little uh, white space here, uh, saying you that the mass of the electron to the mass of the proton is uh, certain on the level of a few times 10 to minus 17 per year, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, alpha is uh, certain on, on a level of a few, a few times 10 to minus 18 per year. So we are safe uh, at that point. Okay, so we don't need to take care of, uh, about that. Can we do better for fundamental physics? Yes, we can do better. So there are uh, transitions in, uh, in nuclei, isomeric transitions at about eight electron volts, which are much more sensitive uh, to potential alpha changes. And there are transitions in highly charged ions, which are also very sensitive on, uh, on, uh, on alpha changes. And uh, this is what we are going to explore in the moment. Now, uh, is it now for all times and all cultures? Uh, so Max Planck would question that, because at one point we deviated from his suggestion. Namely, we took not a fundamental constant of nature, but a property of an atom. You could take any atom, so to say, for the second, for the frequency. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are a lot of changes. Today, we have not only the cesium fountain clocks, but today we have optical clocks with optical transitions, which are 100,000 times faster than the cesium uh, transition. Uh, and here in, at PDB, we explore one, for instance, uh, from, uh, from 2S1 half to F7 2 half. You see, there's a huge, uh, highly forbidden, very narrow line uh, in iterbium plus in a trap. Systematic uncertainty, 3 times 10 to minus 18. Two orders of magnitude better than the present realization of the second. Uh, now, for the realization of a second, you have to compare that with other clocks worldwide, actually. How to connect these clocks? We have demonstrated that, at least over continents, this is feasible by linking PDB with Paris and also with London through an optical fiber link. And there we have demonstrated that you can transfer frequencies with an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 20 over thousands of kilometers. And we have compared the first, for the first time, optical clocks over a large distance uh, being about uh, yeah, a factor of 10 better in the moment uh, than uh, optical clock, than, uh, than the definition of the cesium atom. But um, it is is also very much faster because the oscillation goes faster. And presently, there are new uh, yeah, um, uh, technologies being developed in, uh, at NIST, for example, and other places as well, uh, with an, an air transmission of frequencies through air. This would be important to go through satellites back and forth over continents, and they demonstrated 10 to minus 18 for this uh, laser air link. Now, the question is, what? What is a picture? So this is actually the relative uncertainty since uh, of, the, of the cesium clocks over the years. We, de we defined the second here uh, on, the, on the cesium-based definition, and then you see 
was a factor of 100 better. Then came these optical transition, and you see the slope in which the uncertainty decreases is much, much higher, and now we are here. Now we have about three or four optical clocks worldwide on a level of a few times uh, 10 to minus 18, and recently, one of the pioneers in this field, Junier from Nest in Chile, he showed us a, a slide which I essentially have stolen, uh, that he is uh, very much convinced that this continues for some time until uh, the level of 10 to minus 21. At least this is what he wants to achieve in his life. Um, that would then be enable us to directly search for dark matter. Uh, gravitational wave detection would become possible with these sensors. These sensors are extremely sensitive to the Earth's gravitational field. Even now, 1 times 10 to minus 18 is 1 centimeter height difference in the Earth's gravitational field. So, uh, GRC is very excited about the possibilities uh, to see the local gravitational potential. Here it would be a few micrometers, which is actually very difficult then uh, in a trap and so on to define that. Uh, and different layers in cold atom uh, lattices would have different gravitational shifts and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of ch challenges coming if we come to this point. So relativistic geodesy, Einstein, uh, gravitational, uh, and a lot of fundamental tests can be done with these kind of things. Even now already we do fundamental cost, uh, tests on Lorentz invariance and so on and so forth. The question is, when, should we, when is it time to redefine the second? This depends on time. Nobody knows exactly when it will be. Uh, but there is, uh, there is a consultative committee of the meter convention for time and frequency. Uh, and they, in, they, they at least um, set up some criteria uh, what, uh, what should be fulfilled before you redefine. And it might be some hope that it might be 2026. I think it's even later. But we have a lot of time because in the moment there is no pressure to redefine. So whatever you need, uh, GPS and so on, is so far so good with our present system. So we can take a little bit time for that one. And with that, I would like to conclude. Um, I think we have approached the most abstract definition of units which you can, uh, which you can practically uh, set into place presently. Uh, it is a huge achievement of mankind. I think it's a huge achievement of practically all nations in the world, in a world where uh, you sometimes have the feeling it's falling apart. This brings you together. So we have a kind of a world currency of measurement equations and measurement bases where everybody can rely on. Uh, and uh, this was obviously the achievement of many, many, many famous people over many, many, many years. So this is yeah, glo nearly bringing uh, to an end an effort of mankind which was uh, taking 5,000 years or so. Uh, and it will come into force on World Meteorology Day in 2019. Thank you very much for your attention.